friends, welcome back to another Pints with Jack episode, or a half pint. Uh, I'm, I have not had the conversation with David of where this is going. I'm trying to convince him for this to go on both feeds because I want everyone, we have different subscribers across different platforms to be able to hear this conversation because this is going to be a unique one. It's, it's a, an individual probably similarly on the same level of Lewis that's had an impact in my life. And maybe not as many of his, I've read more Lewis books. I'd actually say for a singular book, one of his books that we will go into depth here is probably the number one book that had an impact on my spiritual journey. And, uh, and I'm going to be joined and I am joined by an individual who knows way more about this person also loves this individual. And so that makes me really excited too. And more than all of that, this individual has been a, the number one recurring guest on our, <laughs> our podcast and someone who has made it in the and um, reviews section, like we don't, we, people leave us reviews and, be, and uh -huh. we've had a few of them where they say, I loved Dr. Kristen Ditchfield Lazo. It's, it's not like, in, because in reviews, <laughs> you know, it, you don't, people don't typically highlight singular guests. They more talk about the dynamics of the co-hosts and stuff in, in that. And so um, you've made that as well. So yes, the cat's out of the bag. So we're going to be talking about Henry now and, and going to be doing it with Dr. Kristen Ditchfield Lazo who no introduction is necessary. She's been on a number of times, as you guys know, uh, and is married to, in the better half of one of our co-hosts, Father Lazo, uh, mm -hmm. who I just, who was also known as the tech guy who helped get this <laughs> set up. <laughs> That's and right. so, yes, today's gonna be fun. It'll be a little bit different too, then it's, it's, I am going to let her uh, bring the scholarly knowledge because I do not have that with uh, Henry now. But this will be more conversational of us just talking about the impact he's had in our lives and mm -hmm. um, some of his books and some of his themes and really encouraging uh, you guys, hopefully indirectly through this, to desire to incorporate him into your spiritual journey. And there's, I have no doubt, and I take very seriously stamps of approval when I put them out there, that he will be very much worth your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me start, well, first, actually, before I do the biographical information of Henry Nowen, let's start with what we're drinking, because I'm yes. drinking something not so unusual for the podcast, but you're drinking, <laughs> well, I don't know what you're drinking, but you're drinking it in something really cool. So let's see it. I have got some herbal tea for this rainy afternoon here mm. in uh, Central Florida, and on the front of my mug is a, a picture of Henry Nowen. And on the back, it has a fabulous quote. Can I read it to you? Yes, every bit of it. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. Mm. And as we'll learn about later, to be able to do that, you have to live out of the life of the beloved. <clears throat> yes. I love that. So let me start with a little bit of biographical information on him, uh, copy and pasted from online. <clears throat> Henry Nouwen was a Dutch Catholic priest, professor, writer, and theologian. His interests were primarily in psychology, pastoral ministry, spirituality, social justice, and community. Over his lifetime, Nouwen authored around 40 books on various aspects of the Christian spiritual life. He was born in the Netherlands in 1932, studied at the Catholic University of Nijmegen, am I saying that right? I don't speak Dutch, so go for it. <laughs> um, before, we're already getting into all the classic map blunders in the first five minutes here. Um, before moving to the United States, where he taught at the Menninger Foundation and then at the University of Notre Dame, Yale Divinity School, Harvard Divinity School. His work was known for his combination of rigorous scholarship with an approachable style that could be appreciated by a lay audience. Some of his most mm -hmm. famous books include The Wounded he Healer, In the Name of Jesus, Life of the Beloved, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And I can't stress that appreciated by the lay audience because I'm one of those individuals. <laughs> he just makes things understandable, and that's what I love about him. A key theme throughout Nowen's life was his struggle to reconcile his priestly, priestly vocation with his personal struggles, which included experiences of loneliness, insecurity, and depression. I'm imagining people hearing this will be able to relate to that. He was open about these struggles and frequently wrote about them. This honesty about his own struggles made his writing particularly impactful to many people. 
later in life now and became a member of La Arche Daybreak community in Toronto, Canada, a community that helps people with intellectual disabilities. He lived in this community until his death in 1996, serving as their pastor. Is there anything you would like to add to that, Kristen? Uh, you know, he was he was amazing on so many levels, and there are a number of biographies that have been written uh, exploring his personality, his life, um, his career and ministry from many different angles uh, that are are fabulous. But you know, he was he was a celebrity author and speaker in his day and had an impact on incredible an incredible number of world figures i mean uh the the list of people from every walk of life and from nations all over the world uh you know in entertainment in sports in politics who quote now and, and refer to his ministry um it, it's just staggering and then like you said it, what he found um there was an emptiness <laughs> in the fame and there were some negative uh impacts for him of of uh being this public figure and where he found himself being grounded was in that community of of individuals with disabilities um just meeting their ordinary everyday needs nobody there knew that he was a celebrity or that he'd sold so many millions of his books or that he'd been on tv last week or at the world conference <laughs> on whatever you know they just knew him as their friend and not only was that a blessing to them, uh, but it was a huge, uh, huge thing for him to help him toward the end of his life really make peace uh, with who God created him to be and who he was as the beloved. Isn't it amazing his, the thing that I found, I'll be curious what, what you found most relatable to him that drew you in, but his vulnerability, mm -hmm. like he, he understood himself well he was willing to share himself, you know, the struggles, the insecurities, uh, his wounds, his fears. Um, we already talked about loneliness, the emptiness, but then he did it in the context of the bigger spiritual journey so well. Like yes. it, it, it made sense to me. It was like, it's not only that I'm lonely. Okay. We can all relate to that, but then what's the answer? What's the solution to it? How does that fit into the Christian gospel story? And he did that so succinctly, so powerfully, and that just, it drew me to it. It's, it's actually the same way, uh, when I read Mere Christianity, that was my first encounter with C.S. Lewis. I was mm -hmm. really struggling with, um, with an emptiness, with a brokenness, with a loneliness in my life at that time. Things, the worldview that I was following wasn't working, if, if the definition of working is finding a sense of peace and happiness. Right. And I, I stumbled across mere Christianity and it was reading that I was like, I don't know if Christianity is true or not, but I know this way of living seems to be a lot more aligned to probably what would be a proper way of living. What well, was similar with now when I was, I was reading it, and I'm like, I see myself in this. I can relate to this. Everything he's saying, we'll, we'll talk about the return and prodigal son later, but mm -hmm. when he talks about the world only loves you, if I'm like, well, that's mm -hmm. not the story of my life, <laughs> trying to do all those yeah. ifs. And running that on that like hamster wheel to, to achieve more ifs. And I wasn't going anywhere in terms of a sense of peace. And so, yeah, that, that really kind of drew me into him. Um, was that a similar experience to yourself or what was your experience? Actually, my experience was a little bit different, but you know, Ooh, I like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good because, thing <laughs> because I was, I was born into a really rich, vibrant tradition of faith. I mean, from my mm -hmm. earliest, um, earliest memories were of talking about Jesus and loving Jesus and serving Jesus and, and having parents. I mean, it wasn't perfect. No family is. We had our own, you know, our own dysfunction and challenges. But I grew up in the faith with that kind of worldview already. But where now and really speaks to me, continues to speak to me, is having lived in that faith 30, 40 years into adulthood and grappling with disillusionment and discouragement and despair when you have been on this journey so long and you have lived long enough to see a lot of pain and grief and suffering that's hard to reconcile with your yeah. worldview that you've held, uh, that with new challenges and new seasons of your life, and yes, God has been faithful, but also I still carry this woundedness. My family still has wounds. My friends still have wounds. And how do we live in the tension between what we know is true and what we believe about God and 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 what we experience and how, how do we bring those two together and reconcile those things? And how do we continue to grow and love and trust Jesus every step of this journey? 
What, what was the first, for you, what was the first book you encountered with now? Like when, when in your life was that roughly? And um, yeah, what was it and what hit you about it? Uh, well, you know, I'd heard now and quoted a lot by a lot of authors that I respect. And I even quoted him in one of my books and completely forgot that I had, because I, 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 I ran across a great quote and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I've heard of him, people like him. He's, that's really good, he's solid, so I, I quoted him. Um, but I had never actually, <laughs> and you've given me all this cred for being like the expert, I'm no scholar. But I, I had never actually read an entire book by now and until about six or seven years ago. And the book that I stumbled across, it's an unusual one. I've never heard anybody else say this was their first one, but it's called Can You Drink the Cup? And it was I've the never last even book. I've heard of it. I know. <laughs> it's just a little book. It's the last one that he wrote before he died. And he examines where, where Jesus talks to his disciples. You know, they want to be big in his kingdom. They want to, you know, uh, and he says, can you drink the cup? Can you embrace the joy wow. and the suffering that is part of this calling? Yeah, you want to be big shots in my kingdom, but are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to endure what it, you know, the hardships and the heartaches and and glorify God through it all? And it was such a powerful read. I I underlined so much of it. It's ridiculous. Uh, every, you know, and I loved it. And that led me to want to read a little bit more and a little bit more. So I read two or three of his other books. We'll talk about some of those, The Return of the Prodigal. And then I learned that Northwind Seminary has a degree program where you can study um, spiritual formation as taught by Nowen. And it's, uh, <laughs> and, the, and the professor, you know, so I love spiritual formation. And the professor, Michael Christensen's become a good friend. Um, he was friends with Nowen. And so, and he's written books about Nowen. And I thought, hey, I've enjoyed this so much. So it's it's only been in the last three or four years, um, but as I got my doctorate through Northwind and I studied, that's when I read four or five biographies of Nowen, and I got to read about fifteen or twenty of his books and and really dive deep and uh, and that was more, as much for my own personal enrichment as anything else because as you've said, uh, Nowen is just uh, profound and his wisdom has been so life changing and encouraging for me. I, I, there's probably not a book title that has drawn me in more than can you drink the cup? And <laughs> it made me think of, have you ever heard of St. Maximilian Colby? No, I haven't. Tell me more. So he's considered, it, it, he's considered the saint of Auschwitz. So he was this wonderful oh, wow. individual who uh, prior to Holocaust had just started this profound ministry that was this monthly magazine, I might be butchering a few things, but r r essentially reached and evangelized roughly a million people a month. Wow. Incredible operation pre-technology uh, mm -hmm. or digital age technology. Well, anyways, he goes, he's, he's brought into the Holocaust and he ends up sacrificing his life for another individual. So they were selecting 10 people. The way it worked is if you, to discourage people from running away, if someone ran away, they would kill 10 people. And oh, wow. it really discouraged people from running away because you knew you were going to be responsible for the death of 10 other people. So they're putting these 10 people in a starvation chamber. One person started breaking down. I have a family. I have a wife. I have kids. And he stepped in for this individual. And they let him do that. And he took his place. And then he died uh, for this person. And to me, I found the humility of that. One, he's willing to drink the cup mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. But think about, like, you as an individual have that great of an impact. You're, you're reaching millions of people. You're evangelizing them, bringing them to Christ, bringing salvation to these people. And yet he was so humble. He didn't have an ego to think, well, my life is quite valuable. I should try to make it through here so I can continue for another 40 years evangelizing. Right. That would be a natural thought for a, 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 a human to think. And he goes, no, I'm going to lay my life down for this person. Mm. And I was like, that's the extreme version other than Christ, obviously, of drinking this cup. Right. And he's probably one of my favorite saints because of that, because one, I, I think he's my favorite saint because I could not do that. Um, but I respect But you know, him. and what, what Nowen points out is that, you know, and that is, that is the implication, that's where you get to. But mm -hmm. where, what he points out in this book is, is that it starts with being vulnerable. Being willing to love, word to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in living in community and being willing to love others as Christ loved them and to will be willing to be loved mm -hmm. and be willing to be transparent. And so we don't start with martyrdom 
we start with being vulnerable <laughs> and loving others and then learning to embrace what God's will is for us, you know, in the ordinary and the everyday that mm-hmm. leads us to be able to make the kind of choice that you just described. See, this is, you just gave me, you stated it so well. He's so practical. It's like, this, this is probably the toughest thing you could ever do is drink this cup. And he gives mm-hmm. practical advice of start small, start with being vulnerable, mm-hmm. receiving mm-hmm. love, giving love. And, and gives you a path to becoming the type of individual that could potentially lay down their life for someone. Yes. That's incredible. I think it was, I think it was uh, Father Lazo who said, um, <laughs> the vulnerable, the, the root of it means to be wounded, to be willing mm. to be wounded. Mm-hmm. I think willing or something like that. Um, and I'll never forget that because that is kind of the core of being vulnerable. You could be hurt and, mm-hmm. and that's a part of it. Um, wow. But if you aren't willing to open yourself up, um, you will, you will be hurt. You will be hurt. Yes. In a different, you're right. I, I, no one's ever really pointed that out. You're going to, you're going to be, that's kind of like one of my more secular quotes that I love is no matter what you experience pain, either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Yes. You might as well choose yes. which one you want. Choose kind of heart. similar. You can experience, you're going to experience pain either way, the pain of yep. vulnerability or the pain of a hard heart. Uh, mm-hmm. But no matter what, you're going to experience pain. I like that. Yeah. Well, and another way to put it is, is we are all going to suffer you, your choices, not whether you will suffer or not, but whether yep. you will suffer with Jesus or without him. Oh, we should just end this right here. <laughs> <laughs> that was well said. I like that. Um, well, let's, let's dive in then uh, to mm-hmm. some of his works and his themes. So we, mm-hmm. let's, start, let's start with the, the return of the prodigal son because uh, that, that was probably the most impactful one for myself. We've already talked about it a little bit. And I'll kick it off here a little bit because this will, this will connect with my, my personal encounter with him a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then I'll have you fill in some of the gaps with this. You know, when I when I first came across Return of the Prodigal Son, it was a season in my life where I was now getting into the workforce, and I'd always struggled with like accomplishments as as my self worth, my identity. Mm. And I'm I'm reading this book, and and just so people understand, so the, the Return of the Prodigal Son, Henry Nowen, uh, he he comes across Rembrandt's painting, The Prodigal Son. And there's different characters in the painting from the prodigal son to the father to the other son to some actually third party viewers as well. And I won't unpack all of those, but he in the story goes through a number of these, uh, all of them from their different perspectives in the roles that we can kind of relate to each of them in different ways. We could be the prodigal son in certain times. We can be the other son that's been in his presence. Uh, we can be the onlooker. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's this beautiful story of all of those different perspectives. And then it finishes with, as we receive the father's love, we're called to become the father, which by the way, one of my favorite movies of all time is our books. The movies I did not actually like, (laughs) I've got to be careful here. The book Les Mis, because I really, I feel like the prodigal son story is in Les Mis, uh, with the, the priest showing love to the prisoner, then the prisoner becomes the person that loves Colette, the, the mm-hmm. prostitute. And so there's a cycle of the love changing. But anyways, in this book, he talks about in the prodigal son, this concept of living out of the state of the beloved. So we're born and, and we are Christ and God's beloved, but the world, maybe the word is seduces us out of that mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. And as we leave that place, we will live in different ways. That's, and in, in, I'll read some stuff in a little bit that just demonstrate what it looks like to live in the state of the beloved and in the state of the world. Uh, and, our, and the journey for us, the spiritual journey, is, is returning to that home, the coming home almost, of being the beloved and understanding we're the beloved and then living out of that space. And so when I encountered this, I, I already said this earlier a little bit, but he, he actually says, this. The world says, yes, I love you if you're good looking, intelligent, and wealthy. I love you if you have a good education, a good job, and good connections. We can all relate to this. I love you if you produce much, sell much, buy much. There are endless ifs hidden in the world's love. These ifs enslave me since it is impossible to respond adequately to all of them. 
It is a world that fosters addictions. I mean, how many of us are stuck in addictions, whether the classic ones or dopamine addictions like TV, social media, scrolling. It's like mm -hmm. we see this uh, because what it offers cannot satisfy the deepest cravings of our heart. And if we live out of this, this is one of my favorite um, uh, parts of this. It talks about how we'll, we'll live with anger, resentment, jealousy, desire for revenge, lust, greed, antagonism, and rivalries. These are signs that we've left home. But there's this part where he talks about the return. And he talks about 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. And mm -hmm. I, I, was, uh, I did this trip to Israel. And when I was in there, our, our, our uh, leader had given us a whole talk on First Kings 19. That's when Elijah's on the mountain and the earthquake comes, the thunder comes, the fire comes. It says God was not in any of those things. Mm. But then the small, still voice comes, and that's where God was. And now and builds off that idea and says, you know, the world's voices are loud, those seductions mm -hmm. that pull us in. But if we still our hearts, if we create silence and solitude, we can begin to rehear that voice that calls us the beloved. And that's probably the way I would describe the book and the things that hit me. And I really needed to hear that because, is I, like I mentioned to you, I really struggled with the ifs side of it. And when we live out of the beloved, we can love more freely. Um, would you? What would you add to that? Well, I think you've done a beautiful job of kind of, of summarizing uh, what was so key. Uh, I mean, it's full of it's full of treasures, and you'll <laughs> underline so many different things as you read it, but. Um, I, I think, you know, when I read it, I, I was kind of born, as I mentioned, I was kind of born into the position of the older brother. Um, mm. that's been my life. <laughs> and then, and then at some point I was humbled enough by my own failures and, uh, and sin and struggles to realize, oh yeah, I'm also the prodigal. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, and I had, I had, I was, I had made my peace with that. Um, I am both and, uh, but it had never occurred to me um, that God is calling us to also be the father, to, to take on yes. that role of welcoming and loving others and, and loving them into the kingdom and showing them mercy and grace. And, and then there was a lot, uh, you know, as someone who's wrestled with some of that older brother syndrome, um, I, there was a lot that he has to say about resentment and gratitude. Mm. And so that really, that really jumped out at me. I think I had, um, he says the discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all that I am and have is given to me as a gift of love, a gift mm. to be celebrated with joy. And I think about wow. how many things I take for granted and how much I need instead of being resentful, of God's mercy shown to others or his blessing shown to others or how simpler or easier or better their life seems to be despite their choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, but to realize how much I've been given and to be grateful for it and to rejoice in it, um, you know, th there was just, uh, there was a lot of powerful stuff in that chapter for me. And it's so, what do you think, how do you think now and says, we go from the position of non-father, whatever those, you know, there's multiple different characters he has there, to the father. What does that look like? Like how do, for, for people that are watching this and they're, they're like, okay, I can relate to this. I'm living with the world. You know, step one is to, to, let me actually take a step back. Step one, if we're living for the world, is to return to the state of the beloved. I'm probably simplifying the steps, but then after we really live out of the state of the beloved to become the father. So what is now and suggests are some ways that we can go from living for the world to living out of the state of the beloved? Well, I, I mean, I think he suggests it's a continual practice, a continual discipline. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that he's most famous for when it, when we talk about spiritual formation mm -hmm. is the way that he, uh, they, the terminology that we use if we want to get all scholarly is that he flipped <laughs> the ladder on its side, right? That, that mm -hmm. for generations, um, Christians have thought about spiritual growth as being like a ladder and you get closer and closer and closer to God. Right. And that raises a lot of questions when we don't feel like we're getting closer and closer <laughs> and we seem to be falling down really? rung after rung. And why haven't I Sometimes made more it's progress? One step up, five steps back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like 
Exactly. And now and said it doesn't look like that. He flipped the ladder on its side and he said, we are always in the process of moving between one of two things, between fear and love, between mm. resentment or anger and gratitude. And sometimes we're closer to one side than the other. And when we notice that we are farther away, when we're closer, when we're living more out of fear than out of love, um, that doesn't mean we've fallen down five rungs. It means we just need to move closer to the five. You know, we need to spend time in prayer, in reflection, in worship, in the word. Um, you know, the Eucharist was very uh, precious to him. Spend time, in, you know, in communion, in community, doing those things that help us move closer to love or gratitude or courage or acceptance or whatever it is, you know, the positive, the virtue and away yep. from away from the negative the the vice or the struggle one of the things i always remember too is his three s's mm -hmm. S I, oh, make sure i get them right <laughs> silence solitude i'm positive with those uh mm -hmm. and i believe it's stillness and i think I that's so. referring to stillness of heart um mm -hmm. it's just so critical to hearing that voice of god and it's amazing when i wake up and i go through seasons of life where work is just causing me more stress and the way i deal with that is just by working harder and and that's always been a struggle and a temptation of mine and then that's usually at the expense of spiritual practices and i'm not slowing down anymore i'm constantly plugged in and it's amazing how i start to believe the voices of the world i hear mm -hmm. them and uh mm -hmm. it's amazing when i when i protect that morning quiet time before the world's waking up and enter into scripture, mm -hmm. enter into a little bit of just complete silence, enter into some journaling, enter into some just conversation with God that it doesn't actually take much to feel a change of heart. <laughs> like yes. even I can, I can be months and months and months in a really just a not great spot in my heart in two weeks of just really coming back to the Lord and his grace is pouring in and I can just feel him and I can hear his presence. And mm -hmm. it's like, he's waiting right there. If you just quiet down and allow him yes. in, it's just, Oh, what would you say before we move on to some of his other books and themes? What would you say are some of the, from, from your experience practices to becoming the father? Like that mm. seems so hard to me because I get what he's saying and I believe him we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. I feel so inadequate even thinking about being the father or loving like the father. Like that just, I don't know. It just seems so difficult. Well, maybe the point is you don't need to be. You can be a sinful person, but still just showing forgiveness and grace to those around you. Um, Maybe the key step is understanding we're broken and that makes it easier to love the brokenness of others. Yeah, I think I think you're on to something there. And I think, and this is just like hugely practical, Henry would probably tell you that some of it has to do with your age. Um, <laughs> that, that, it, that it is, that in, yes, we can all try to love as God loves, but some of it is a stage of life. As you get older, there are a lot of things you can't do anymore. There are a lot of roles you don't play anymore as you get older. Um, my dad is experiencing this, you know, um, for a long time, you know, when he was younger, his father was kind of the big figure in our family. And then the day came when my dad sort of, not to put, say he ascended to the throne, but but he became the patriarch, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, he and he became, became the, the kind of the king, the center in our family, uh, at least in, in the a, lo a loving and kind uh, an amazingly wonderful uh, patriarchal <laughs> figure. <laughs> but Not he's, a tyrant or a dictator? No, no. He is an awesome dad. He is an awesome dad. But um, but then, um, you know, as his children are getting older and they, they have become, his sons have become fathers and now his grandsons are becoming fathers mm. and some of his roles are changing and some of the things that some of the responsibilities and privileges, he doesn't have those anymore. Those have passed on to a new generation. So what do you do? What I mentioned, I bring that up to say, um, as our roles change, as our responsibilities change, what ministry do we have? Well, now and would say, as we get older, we have the ministry of being the father, of reaching our hands out 
to, uh, that's what he talks a lot about is reaching out, that the father runs to those who are hurting and suffering and struggling. Mm -hmm. to, he points out to both the uh, prodigal and the older brother, the father doesn't wait for them. He goes yeah. to them and he brings them in and he loves them and he shows them compassion. And that's something we all can do at different stages of our life. But it becomes, I think, even more sp significant when we have decades behind us of life and, and wisdom and maturity that hopefully uh, yes. makes it possible for us to, to um, uh, embrace our own brokenness and the brokenness of others and show the mercy that we have been shown. When you actually, now that I think about it, sort of provided another um, answer earlier on with the St. Maximum and Colby side of things. When you mentioned starting with vulnerability, mm -hmm. being vulnerable, you don't have to go to martyrdom right away. Right. But like when, 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 you, when you learn to be vulnerable yourself, that creates the ability to love like the father better. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. hard to be the father unless you're willing to be vulnerable. I mean, you really yes. can't be a cold-hearted, non-vulnerable person and somehow become the father. Uh, well, and there. isn't that interesting? Because in that sense, God himself is, as a father, is vulnerable. He makes himself yeah. vulnerable to being hurt by us, to being rejected Jesus by us and wounded. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. the perfect example. Well said. I like that. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to, you mentioned uh, when we were talking a bit uh, in preparation for this, the theme of heartache and suffering. Mm -hmm. What did you uh, mean by that? Can you unpack that a little bit? You know, that's that's where uh, now and really drew me in as he talked about despair, as he talked about disappointment, loneliness and rejection. I didn't feel as much pressure to try to achieve by the world standards, but I have certainly battled my share. What of, does of that this. feel like? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to know what that feels like. <laughs> oh, come to the other side. We have our own hangups. <laughs> okay. The grass is not greener. Okay. No. <laughs> you know, we live with that constant sense of disappointing God or not living up to, you know, when, when the standard is, is pleasing and honoring God with your whole life and doing great things for him. Hmm. And you, you are your whole life with that sense of my life is worth nothing if I don't live for Jesus and do it well. And mm -hmm. what does that look like? Um, it has its own. And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't get all, yeah, if you don't get all those opportunities to serve him, like you dreamed that you would, you know, if you don't feel like you have the kind of ministry that you hoped he would give you or the kind of influence or the opportunity, if, if he doesn't let you do any great things for him. This is coming you know, from someone who has written more books than I could even count <laughs> on, well, on multiple hands. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm with Henry. It doesn't feel all that. It, it feels very glamorous when I'm throwing in another load of laundry and questioning my, you know, my significance <laughs> and my worth in the world. <laughs> I appreciate that vulnerability because that's yeah. yeah. It's amazing how you can write, you can do so many wonderful things and still feel that way. Oh yeah, like, well, it's just, uh, but you know, there's um. I think probably one of the quotes that arrested me so much, uh, and, and it's because I had my big birthday too. I mean, I don't like to advertise this, but I had my 50 and fabulous um, birthday this year. No, <laughs> and when as, was it? Uh, April. <laughs> when in April? April 12th. Ah, uh, I'm, 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 I'm April 6th. April 6th. Okay, so the week yeah. before. Yeah, yeah I, I, as I've been getting a little bit older, believe it or not, I mean, all, all joking about accomplishments aside, I've, like a lot of people my age, I'm looking back at my life and I'm going, gosh, yeah, I've had some cool experiences. I've done some pretty amazing things, but I've also yeah. had a lot of disappointment. And there are a lot of things I thought I was going to do that I didn't get to do. And, and now I know I'm never going to get to do that. I'm never going to get to have that. It's too late for some of these dreams. And, and you know, just all of the things that you deal with as you, you start to get older. So here's what Nowen said that really struck me. He was reflecting on Jesus in John 21, 18. Jesus said, um, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you to where you don't want to go. Now, Jesus was speaking to Peter about the death that he would suffer. But here's what Nowen draws out of that. He says, as we grow older or more spiritually mature, we too may be handed over and with outstretched hands be guided and led to places we would rather not go. 
What was true for Peter will be true for us. Learn the discipline of being surprised, not by suffering, but by joy. As we grow old, there is suffering ahead of us, immense suffering, a suffering that will continue to tempt us to think that we have chosen the wrong road. But don't be surprised by pain. Be surprised by joy. Be surprised by the little flower that shows its beauty in the midst of a barren desert. And be surprised by the immense healing power that keeps bursting forth like springs of fresh water from the depths of our pain. Mm. So see, is he somewhat saying there, you know, if we're connecting this, what you were talking about earlier, of we can have disappointment, we can have despair over missed dreams. Maybe we didn't do what we were hoping to for the kingdom. We feel like we're inadequate in, in many senses. And he's just saying, like, find beauty in the little things. Find, find beauty in awe and wonder and gratitude. Am I hearing that correctly? Yes. And I, and I think just e- even in the simple way, I mean, we talked about doing big things for God, but even in the simple way, as we get older, we lose a lot of people in our lives. We lose our parents. We lose our friends. We, we witness a lot of grief and suffering in the world that's hard to bear. Um, yeah. We, you know, suddenly we need glasses. We need hearing aids. We, we lose our driver's license because we can't, you know, we, we can't shoot those three pointers anymore unless we want to be crippled for the rest of the week. I'm sorry. I hope you, I hope I'm not uh, giving you any spoilers or, or joy to look forward to. <laughs> Once I hit once I hit thirty, I already realized from running and stuff. I'm like, wow, my back is not invincible anymore. <laughs> and and those are, I think he's speaking even to those kinds of losses. Yeah. And to saying, you know, yeah, we don't want. I I, I I've said because maybe because I'm, I'm I don't know, but I, I've said to God a lot of the time, I don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I live want in this. Denial. I yeah. try to go back to like the, the previous eras and seasons. I'm like, I, I, I'm not going to let this stop me. And then I, I don't, ready. I don't want this challenge. I don't want this grief. I don't want this heartache. I don't want this. I don't want this hurt and vulnerability. Um, but it's part of life. And God's asking me to go to some of these places. He's asking me to trust him. You know, there are relationships. Um, I see a lot of people my age and older folks of a generation older than me who are deeply grieved about their kids and their grandkids and their relationships and their regrets and have things they wish they had known to do better or do differently. That's all a part and parcel of getting older. But now and says not to concentrate on those things, uh, but to embrace them, embrace the brokenness, mm-hmm. embrace the suffering and look for the joy that God can bring out of that pain. Look for the mm-hmm. healing, um, look for the hope and that, that it is there. Have you ever read or heard of uh, Frederick Buechner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, has, I've read one or two, so not, not right. as... So he has sure. that book, Telling Secrets, and when I had did a talk on uh, The Beloved for a conference back, you know, it's probably 10 years ago now, I connected it with Telling Secrets as well. And so I now one was definitely the biggest theme of it in Return of the Prodigal Son, but... In Telling Secrets, he talks about how there's this deep, dark part where we have these pains, these wounds, and these fears, and the core of who we are, the parts that our shame sometimes hidden in, our mm-hmm. regrets are hidden in things, a lot of the stuff that you just listed. And a lot of times we will spend life attempting to build walls around that, uh, distract ourselves from that, make sure the world doesn't see that part of ourselves. And he goes, it's when we enter into that that we encounter the one, capital T, capital O. That's the the spot where we encounter Christ's Mm. deepest graces for us, his deepest love for us. He was telling this Telling Secrets book because he was really struggling with a daughter with anorexia to the Mm -hmm. point of two hospitalizations and near death. And it was so painful and such Ah. a struggle as a parent and a father. And it was when he really surrendered to that and entered into that with Christ and stuff, he was able to grow deeper in his relationship. But it goes back to the word we brought up earlier, vulnerability. Mm-hmm. That's so tough. I'd rather live in denial. <laughs> I'd, rather, yes. I'd rather live in denial. I'd rather fight it. I'd rather pretend it's not true. Um, do the whole ego thing where you, you, you protect that. Right. It's, it's such a temptation. This actually connects to another theme of Henry now and that we haven't actually mentioned this word yet that I think is really important. Self-rejection. Mm-hmm. I love that now and points out he doesn't really think pride is the root of all 
evil. I mean, it's not like he's trying to go against what Scripture says. But he's like, pride is just covering up a deeper truth, mm-hmm. self-rejection. Mm-hmm. Like, the more insecurity, self-rejection, lack of self-worth you have for yourself, typically you, you mask that with an ego, with pride. You know, right. People that in today's society use more psychology are the most narcissistic at their core. They're actually usually the most insecure, and they've done a lot to fight that. And I'd never heard it phrased that way. And when you, when you see that, one, that's really helpful for your own journey to understand the self-rejection that we have and the way it impacts our life. And the fact that living out of, uh, not living out of, receiving the love of God in the state of the beloved is the cure to that. But it's really helpful for seeing others as well who are mm-hmm. people we might not like. They've treated us poorly. They've hurt us. Uh, they might be obnoxious in certain ways. They might have a big ego. And when we really realize that most likely there's a self-rejection somewhere in there, Mm -hmm. there's some pain, there's some wound, there's some brokenness. That was also a profound theme that came out to me in his books. Mm -hmm. He never felt good enough. Um, He came from Mm -hmm. a really successful family and from a father who had great expectations for him. And he was a brilliant mm-hmm. scholar, but there were some things that weren't his, his cup of tea. And there were some areas where he was not as successful or he, he was constantly tempted to compare his achievements to his peers and to others. And he felt deep seated rejection. Um, <laughs> and he was really needy. Um, everybody, even the people who love him the best That's in the so world, yeah, that, talk that's about how needy he was and that, you know, you could almost never reassure him enough of how much you loved him. You could never be there enough for him, you know, that he was constantly feeling wounded if you, you know, if you couldn't be there every minute when he needed you. And and he was aware of that. He was, he was aware of that. Um, but he that loneliness and that, like, like you said, that self-rejection, um, you know, it, it gave him great compassion. It made him very tender and loving, but it was something that he battled his whole life is to find who he was in the beloved, as he put it, to understand and really grasp God's love for him and let that be enough. What would you say to someone who's hearing this and being like, well, is that a sign that he didn't, he was unsuccessful in receiving God's love? Was that a sign? I mean, if, if God is enough, if God's the, the restfulness for our restless hearts, um, he's where we find rest. Does that mean he unsuccessfully did that? Does that mean he just, this was a cross God wanted him to bear specifically at that more extreme form because it led to such wisdom and, and compassion and he'll find the fulfillment of that neediness in eternity. So he just wasn't as fortunate maybe as some are to maybe achieve more of that on this side. Like, what, what, how, what, how would you speak to that? Wow. Um, well, Yes, and. <laughs> I, I realize that I say that's a tough question because you're essentially like, I'm asking you, did he love Jesus enough and allow Jesus to love him enough? Yes, <laughs> I... Really I your spiritual journey. <laughs> well, let me say, first of all, I, th- I think he, he... I think that we can say, I'm comfortable saying, looking at the world and how it works and how the life of faith works and how generations of people have seen it, that yes, some people have unique, deep wounds that God allows for whatever reason, and they have uniquely difficult, painful battles that that they may never get victory over completely this side of eternity. But God uses it, and His beauty and His power shines brightly through their brokenness. And yes, they battle it all their lives, but that's that's their thorn well it's it's paul and the thorn in the flesh right did paul not just did he not love jesus enough so i i would say yeah some people have unique wounds and he he certainly was deeply wounded and that's what made him so compassionate a healer Mm -hmm. um i think also that he did love jesus and he fought the (laughs) battle i mean miss that he has a book, The Wounded Healer. <laughs> yeah, see what I did there. Um, uh, so. <laughs> wanted to make sure people watching understood that that was well played. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think, I think that I, I push back against the idea that if you just have enough faith, you can overcome everything. I think he certainly had yeah. moments where he triumphed. He had moments where he was confident and self-assured and moments yeah. where he was moving closer to that remember we said moving from side to side when he was closer to calm and peace and certainly and feeling loved and operating out of that and he had moments when he was more insecure 
and yeah. when he wrestled. And I think that's true for, for all of us. And it's not a matter of our faith, uh, how much faith we have or how much we love Jesus. It's, it's part of the human condition. We're going to struggle. Mm-hmm. We're going to have trouble sometimes. Rich Mullins has a song about that, I think. You know, there, there's going to come some trouble <laughs> in this life. Yep. Um, but, but we don't give up. We persevere and we hold on as tight as we can, knowing that God is holding on even tighter to us. Hmm. I see here. So I've only ever read Return of the Prodigal Son, The Way of the Heart, The Life of the Beloved, and I believe Wounded Healer. Those are great. But I see here, you've already brought up, can you drink the cup? And we've talked about that. I presume, because this is on here, Simon's course, have you read With Burning Hearts and Meditation on the Eucharistic Life? Ooh, yes. Oh, that title is getting me quite intrigued. What, what yes. is he? What is he communicating in that one? That just—I mean, I okay. So I read this book like a year and a half ago. So again, you know, I'm not this great lofty. I'm still reading. I'm still learning. I'm still finding more <laughs> that I love, and it's full of beautiful. Uh, if you get the book, it's full of beautiful icons and paintings. Um, oh. But it's it's Henry's reflection on the significance of every part of the Eucharist. And it's framed around um, one of my favorite passages of scripture of all times. Uh, The phrase with the title, with burning hearts, comes from the road to Emmaus and Jesus's encounter with the disciples. Mm. Again, who were grieving because they thought everything had fallen to pieces and the world was coming to an end and it was all hopeless and miserable. And as they walked along the road, Jesus met them there. And then they said, uh, and then he, when he disappeared later, uh, after revealing himself to them, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And so Henry talks about how we can experience Christ in the Eucharist, in the various parts of the communion service. And and it goes much deeper than that. He goes on to talk about uh, suffering and pain and joy and hospitality, welcoming the stranger. Are are we willing to listen and to make space? Sometimes Jesus comes to him, to us, and we turn him away. You know, we don't make time for him like you were talking about. I do that more often than not. (laughs) I I, I was, I was, uh reading i'm reading this book right now that goes through a number of the lives of the saints and one of them i can't remember it was Teresa of, of avila or catherine of siena talking about some visions of of hell and i was thinking to myself and i was also thinking about dante's divine comedy i have not read it but david interviewed someone this actually was just released a couple of weeks ago for the podcast because lewis liked dante and was influenced by mm-hmm. him and I always feel like one of the rungs of hell, I hope I never experience this, would be like seeing all of the things you missed, like what mm. torment it would be to get be in front of a TV and to see this person. Like, let's say they were, you get the backstory of the 10 hours that led up to when they encountered you and they just had all this suffering and struggling and lost their job at work and had this other stuff. And then they encounter you for 10 seconds and you snap at them, you make their life worse. And yet Mm. you had that moment, God brought a moment there where you could have been a little bit of a tree in a desert for that individual. Like how much torment would that be? Because I have to imagine I've done that 10,000 times. If you think about how many times I've encountered people in my life and I'm just moving on and maybe they're just neutral interactions and I miss the opportunity to bless, Uh, but some Mm -hmm. of them probably are negative. It, well, and some of them may have been Jesus himself wanting to speak into our hearts and lives. Mm. And, and that's what now says. He says, Jesus, in this book, he says, Jesus never forces himself on us. Unless we invite him, he will always remain a stranger. <laughs> it's, I know, it's so good. You have to read this one. This is one of my favorites. My favorites are, are kind of unorthodox, but they, in the, in the now in canon, but He just has so much to say about welcoming the stranger who Jesus appeared to be to those disciples Mm -hmm. and how we might have a divine encounter um, with Christ if we will open our hearts and allow him to open our eyes to see it. That and your your uh, your cup one drink the cup are going to be two that I read in the next month. For Yay. sure. <laughs> they just, I've been wanting to, I've been wanting, I love the concept of the sacramental life. Now the Eucharistic mm-hmm. life is a much, it's a more narrow version of that, but just that idea to me is just so incredibly beautiful. Um, well, before we, we wrap up here, any, any other things that I might not have naturally, or we didn't naturally talk about that, that about now in any themes, any concepts or anything uh, that you'd like to share? No pressure. Um, done a lot yeah, stuff, maybe 
Yeah, well, we've, I'm, I love talking, we could talk all day, <laughs> and, and um, I, I can't wait to hear what you think about these books when you've had a chance to read them. I, I think there are two things I'd like to mention, and one is just yeah. the awareness. Some of the things that we're talking about today, maybe um, maybe somebody listening is going, you know, yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> um, but Henry had some ideas, you know, Henry, his work has been out there for 40, 50 years, and he really had a transformative effect on how Christians approach counseling and how we approach suffer, uh, oh, suffering and vulnerability and so on. Um, you yeah. know, he grew up in an era when when experts and authorities presented themselves as as um, without flaw, right? Like if you wanted to if you wanted to get advice from your pastor, you expected him to be someone who never wrestled with sin. Because hmm. because you were looking to him as a, and that's the I don't know if I'm putting it very well, but that's the kind of the culture that he grew up in that the world had this sort of the expert authority on high, who doesn't relate to our common struggles, and we go to them because they are so wise and so all knowing, and and Henry flipped that around, and with his vulnerability and his writing that has had such an enormous impact, said you know we go to that wounded healer. We go to the one who knows their brokenness, who has struggled like we have and has found hope and can point us to that hope. And, and the, I can't explain if, if you, you know, how revolutionary that was in some ways um, or has been in certain circles to realize that it's out of our woundedness that we, you know, that God uses us to heal others. Well, and that's, I, it, it, it's, that idea, you're, you're so right about how much that permeated culture and, and how it's, it's, even today, people have a hard time with that. Like in a secular, let's, let's even take out the spiritual side it, or even the psychological side. In the secular sense, leaders of businesses were finally starting to realize that vulnerability in leadership is a positive. Mm -hmm. you know, CEOs are constantly told they need to pretend they have everything together. They have no fear. They have this perfect vision. Whenever there's an issue, they can solve it. And studies are showing, research is showing, vulnerability is a profound thing for leadership. And so mm -hmm. leading with your brokenness, leading with your fears, leading with your humanity is actually a much better way. And so it's amazing how he was so ahead of the times on that. Mm -hmm. Like we're mm -hmm. just starting to get this kind of acceptance in the last 10, 15 years. I never really thought about that. That's a yeah, really well, good point. I don't want to hear from somebody who I, I don't want advice from somebody who's never struggled, um, who's never been My tempted. Life's perfect. The, you know what <laughs> I mean? Struggled. That's why I'm doing this podcast. I got it all together. <laughs> I figured I'm going to share this wisdom with everybody. <laughs> that's how it used to be. That's that's how what the perspective used to be is. You know, I can't let anybody know I've ever had a struggle. And now we say, I want somebody who's been in the trenches. I want mm -hmm. somebody who knows what my life is like, who has wrestled with these things and found some victory. Maybe a little further down the road than I am. Maybe they've won a few battles more, but I want somebody who can speak to this because they've been there. And and Henry was a huge influence in helping us see it that way. Um, there's one other thing I'd like to mention. So there are a, a half a dozen great biographies. Um, I mean, there's more than that, but Henry's been written about a lot. And there are some great books about him. There are some great books by him, 40 or 50. It's hard to give a number because uh, there, a lot of books are compilations of his lectures uh, and sermons and interviews through the years, his classes that he taught. And so, you know, did he write it or it's a, well, kind of, it's a, it's a compilation of his work. <laughs> but there is a great new biography that was released last year. It's called Flying, Falling, Catching. Uh, Henry, and it's by Henry Nowen and Carolyn Whitney Brown. And it's um, mm -hmm. toward the end of his life, Nowen became obsessed with the circus. And he followed, he traveled with this circus troupe for like a year really? or two years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was fascinated by these trapeze artists. And he saw such a profound spiritual life lesson about letting go and being caught uh, and flying and falling and vulnerability and all the things that we've talked about. And I think this is the best, instead of treating it like an oddity, like what a weird thing. He was so obsessed with the circus and he followed, he traveled with this troupe. <laughs> uh, Carol Whitney Brown has done a beautiful job of tying in how it fits in his whole life, what he learned spiritually and, um, and how it reflects kind of as he came to the end of his life, what he was learning and how he was growing and what God was speaking to him. And it's, it's great. So I recommend that one too. Wow. I... He has a gift with seeing, like even just the prodigal son, the, the, the painting. He mm -hmm. sees this thing and he sees all of life lesson in this painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he sees mm -hmm. 
this the the trapeze. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're doing that, and he sees the way that they have to fully surrender. I mean, yes. I, I've been to a number of Cirque du Soleil's, and the way they're just they give. First of all, they give everything. Mm -hmm. They're all in mm -hmm. on the jump, and then their hands are fully out. Mm -hmm. And they're like expecting to be caught by the next person. And they can't have the slightest amount of hesitation because that right. will break the connection. Right. I mean, that, that is really a profound, I never thought of that. But they also don't have to do anything but, but let go. Jump. And oh, be caught. If they, try, if they try to help themselves, they'll screw it up. They have to let themselves be caught. Oh. And so if you think of God the Father reaching out his hands ready to catch us. All we have to do is let go, right? Well, it's, so it's just, it's cool. This, list. <laughs> <laughs> this is, oh man, I'm reading right now. This, this, this is the one that I'm getting through right now. It's not a now in book, but it's just oh, one wow. of the most incredible books. The Fulfillment of All Desire by Ralph Martin. This is my chance to make sure people also see that one. Cause it's just yes, so good. I, once oh, I, I finish put this, that in my list. these next three are uh, <laughs> going to be on my list. Um, well, that's incredible. Well, I've got nothing else. Um, so Dr. Kristen Ditchfield Lazo, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, in case there are new people watching this, any place people can find you, stuff like that, a little bit more information. Uh, oh, sure. Press, I'm on but... social. I'm on social media and I have a, a website. Um, I use my uh, maiden name because I, I, my handsome prince didn't come into my life until I was well into my 40s. <laughs> Had already written a lot of books by then. So uh, you can find me at Kristen Ditchfield. So it's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N. My parents were Jesus people during the uh, Jesus Revolution and they named me Christ in. So Kristen. Wow. Is that where yeah. it came from? I love yeah. that. Uh, and so Ditchfield. Beautiful. Yeah, so kristenditchfield.com. Thank you. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much for um, coming on. We don't actually usually do the regular sign-off uh, with, with these, so um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome.